Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the second live for the Wildlife Ambassador Program here at the Belize Wildlife and Referral Clinic. <clears throat> so, just to go over what we will be discussing today, um, we'll have a short video from the Forest Department talking about the Wildlife Protection Act and uh, some a few insights on what CITES is and the IUCN Red List. And then we will be talking about the rabies as the zoonotic um, disease for this life and raccoons as the conflict species also for this life. Um, <laughs> that is right, guys. Um, hello again. My name is Gian and this is Calvin. And we're glad to be here once again live uh, with you all. And again, this is monthly and please feel free to share. Um, and if you want to collaborate and um, help us out with something, you know, you are always welcome. Today we have the director of uh, the wildlife program from the forest department, Ms. Victoria Kawich, which, which we will be hearing of in just a minute. So stay tuned. Do not disconnect. We will be with you all and uh, we'll be able to share. And yes, we have quizzes uh, and small little questions where you can win um, neat little prizes. You can win some wristbands uh, and some stickers here from the clinic. So stay tuned and don't disconnect. We have plenty of good content for you all today. Um, several things, right? We will be doing a monthly uh, zoonotic diseases. So super important for us to learn uh, when it comes to wildlife. And we'll also be looking at a conflict species of the month. For today, it's going to be raccoons and uh, we're going to announce the other one for the other live. When is the other live, uh, Calvin? The other live, which is next month, will be the 15th of December at the same time. So uh, maybe you could put it into your schedule. It's, <laughs> we hopefully make it just for one hour so as not to take up too much time. All right. So definitely join us December the 15th. Mark your calendars. And we will be with you once again. And if you notice, there's a poll for the zoonotic disease of the month for that live. So you guys can go ahead and vote for which one you want. The poll is under the discussion section of this uh, live event. That is right. All right. Well, first things first, we want to uh, leave the time to our director, Dr. Isabel, who will be uh, sharing a little bit about the wildlife ambassador program as you see in my shirt um you know we are part of uh we're the wildlife educator under this program uh, and she will be sharing to you about how you can join what is it um and then you know for who is it as well all right so please help me to welcome dr isabel so well, good afternoon from me as well, and welcome, welcome to our second monthly live event here. Um, thank you so much for joining us right now or watching this later on. And I would like to give you a very, very big invitation to join the program. So join the Wild Lab Ambassador program. Uh, we will be providing uh, free training. We hope to include our partners' messages and um, we hope to join forces as much as possible in this mission. So what is this program about? We hope to improve uh, the response to wildlife emergency. We also hope to assist in reducing human wildlife conflict and crime. And last but definitely not least, the zoonosis risk to humans. Um, so as a brief update, uh, we started the program with our lovely educators two months ago, and we are getting ready now to start reaching out to partners to do a first training for uh, partner organizations and organizations that have educators that may be interested in joining uh, this program for our 2022 activities, which will involve a lot of uh, training workshops. So what is this program again? It consists mostly in training and outreach, like what we're doing right now. 
and there is a toolkit that um, has been compiled and has been made available in the past. This is uh, also still available on our website. So please go to the BWRC website under educational resources and outreach, find the Wildlife Ambassador Program, and you will see several documents there, um, which will address human wildlife conflict issues, illegal traffic, and wildlife emergencies with the goals to prevent, mitigate, and or uh, respond to these situations and to train our partners to assist in this. Uh, in all of this, we use the so-called One Health approach where we emphasize the link between human, animal, and environmental health, and there will be also a lot of zoonosis talks. Um, so, Tiana already mentioned, we put a poll up there. We would also like to very much encourage you to suggest any zoonotic diseases that you know of that you would like to learn more about, and we will include those. So, uh, same as the guys said, please feel free to join us for these monthly uh, lives. Check out our website and our social media pages. And to us, the next step will now be to reach out to partner organizations. And we have a tentative date for a training on the 10th of December that we hope to invite you to. We hope you will take advantage to uh, get free training for uh, your staff, for example, and uh, learn about these topics. Um, we will reach out to the partners from 2018, but we also want to very much encourage you to reach out to us if you see this. Uh, we also hope to get your help in revising the same toolkit that we prepared in 2018, because we're sure there are some updates that could go into there. We hope to include the partner organization's messages in there, for example. Uh, and we very much hope that you will participate in uh, these first sessions, which will very likely all be virtual, uh, and let us know uh, what maybe should be included in this toolkit or what should be changed. So again, you can find this on our website already, uh, as it was uploaded there in 2018. Uh, do not hesitate to send us any questions via email, use our hotline, um, and so on. And I think that is the end of my uh, little list of notes. So thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoy what you will learn today. And uh, we are here to assist you. Uh, and with that being said, without further ado, I will pass on to Ms. Victoria Kawich who will uh, talk to you about uh, wildlife legislation, um, permits, and the wildlife program under the forest department. Um, thank you very much. So, hi, um, my name is Victoria Kawich. Um, I am a forest officer. I work for the forest department. I am currently the wildlife manager for the for the forest department i've been employed in or been in the forest department for 10 years um i have um well the wildlife program consists of myself and other staff i have um three personnel under the wildlife program i have one forester and two forest rangers um, who are attached to the program um, we also have offices Throughout the country, we have offices in Orange Rock. We have in Balopan, which is the headquarters. We have an office in San Ignacio. We have an office in Douglas de Silva, which is in the Mountain Pine Ridge. Um, we have an office, to, we have two offices down south. One is the Savannah Forest Station. And this is located about, I would say five minutes um, before we reach Independence Village. And then we have the Machaca Forest Station, which is about 20 minutes from um, town, from Punta Gorda town. Um, so that is the Machaca Forest Station. Uh, so we have offices throughout the country that you can um, reach out to. Um, also, what I'm going to present to you about, talk to you about a bit, is the Wildlife Protection Act. 
chapter 220 of the laws of Belize. Um, and the Wildlife Protection Act basically um, regulates and monitors the use of wildlife resources. It establishes restrictions on hunting. It gives an open and closed season for the species that can be hunted. It gives a list of species that cannot be per cannot be hunted and that are protected by law. Um, it also establishes powers of officers like myself um, and also establishes offense and penalties. So um, I would like to start off first giving you the definition of wildlife. Um, wildlife is considered all undomesticated mammals, again, all undomesticated mammals, birds, reptiles, and all parts, all parts, eggs, nests of any of these forms of wildlife. So let me break down that definition a little bit for you. Um, wildlife is not only the animal itself, but wildlife is anything that we derive from the animal. Meaning, if we kill a deer and we skin the deer, um, the skin itself is still considered a wildlife. So you cannot keep the skin because it's considered an offense. Um, uh, you, we're talking about feathers, we're talking about fangs, we're talking about tooth. Um, anything that comes from this wild animal is considered wildlife. Um, it also, the definition is very clear. It says eggs are also considered um, part or form, are considered under definition as wildlife. Um, their nest is also considered wildlife. So any of these forms is considered wildlife. So if you are found in possession of any of these Things mentioned, you can be charged for unlawful possession. Um, and it's a real charge that you can get. Um, so like I mentioned, wildlife, keeping or having any of these forms of um, animals, parts, eggs or nest is considered wildlife. It's not only the animal. Um, so I hope I didn't confuse you and I give you a good <laughs> definition of what it, what is the definition of wildlife. Um, also, like I mentioned, the, the app gives a list of species that are protected by law, no matter what, they're protected by law, by our laws. It is protected. You cannot hunt them and you should not keep them and should not, you should not have in your possession. It's illegal to have them. Um, and so species that are protected by law are, for example, this, the, the two species of monkeys, we only have two species of monkeys and it is the spider monkey and the howler monkey. Those two species are protected by law. We also have the five species of cats, which are the jaguar, the puma, the ocelot, the margay, and the jag jagurundi. So those are the five species of cats and all of them are protected by law. Then we have obviously the, the beardies tapir tapir which is the national animal um, obviously it is under protection um, we have the two species of crocodiles please don't say alligators we don't have any alligators in Belize it's crocodiles and we only have two species um, the first species is the saltwater crocodile and the second species is the freshwater cro crocodile which is also known as the morlet crocodile so the two species of crocodiles and they're protected by land we also have the kinkajou um or we would call it i think the night crawler it's also protected by by law we have the giant ant eater um protected by law um we have the porcupine is also protected by law um the manatee is protected by law um and then we have that all birds are protected by law there are only let me see six species of birds that are not protected by law that means you can hunt them and you can have them and this are the chichalaca the crested guan the great curacao the black throated bob white the blue winged teal and the lesser scallop so those are the six species of birds that are not protected by law and that you can have in your possession um, of course with a permit 
with a permit, not just keep them without a permit. You can have these six species or you can hunt these six species, let's say, um, so that you can have or you can hunt them, let me say. Um, but all other bird species are protected by law. All other bird species are protected by law. So all your parrots are protected by law. Everything, all, all birds, all other birds except those six species are protected by law. Um, the Forest Department, I can't recall when, maybe in 2014 or 13, thereabouts, um, started to issue permits to, to, to the public so that they can legally keep their parrots because it was impossible for us to go and confiscate all of the parrots that people have in captivity. Um, and so we started a pet registration or a captive wildlife registration um campaign and this basically allowed um the owners to come in and register their or apply for their parrots and legally register them and so this this is a process it's not you come apply and you get your permit automatically you apply then the forest department does a series of inspections um if you pass the screening of these inspections then your bird is given a pretty little ring or a band and you're given a, a legal permit um so those are for parrots um for any other species we're not entertaining it we're not giving permits for these species um so that is for for parrots only um so please don't tell me you want to keep a monkey or you have a jaguar and you want to keep it no we do not allow that the only animal you can and are allowed to keep and come and register is parrots. Um, so I'm not also I'm not even encouraging you also to go and go get a parrot and say I can have one. Um, so if it's baby parrots, it's no. If you have a baby parrot, you cannot keep it. Sorry, you cannot keep it. This registration is for parrots that have been. Um, that you've had for several years, two, three years, four years. And also, in order for you to keep these parrots, these parrots need to have a nice, decent cage and they must be in good, have a good, healthy condition. If they don't have a good, healthy condition, then obviously you're not being going to be able to keep that parrot. It won't be confiscated from you. And so that is, that is one of the things that I need to highlight. Also, the forest department does give out um, permits for hunting, meaning you need to come and apply for your hunting permit. You apply, you fill out the application. You must present a valid social security, a valid hunter's license, um, a valid gun license. I'm, I'm sorry, a valid gun license, and then you apply. You pay a fee of a hundred dollars per year, and then you can get a hunting permit. Um, so that is another permit you can come and apply. There is a dealer's um, permit that you can get and dealer's permit is issued to those people who sell, buy and sell game meat. Um, so for you to legally sell game meat, you need to have a dealer's permit. Um, that is $2,000 two thousand dollars a year for that um you also again come in you fill out the application um you need to provide your source and your source whoever you're buying or getting your material your meat from needs to have a valid hunting permit so if your deal or if your supplier does not have a valid hunting permit you will not be able to get a dealer's permit um so that that is the other permit you can get we also give scientific research permit for people who come in and want to do research in the country you must also have a permit to to, to um to do research in the country so you need to come in and apply get an application fill out your application provide all the necessary documentation and then you can get a a scientific research permit um that is the other permit that we issue we also issue import and export permits, meaning if you want to import a bird, an exotic bird that we don't have, um, then you need to come in and apply for it. And there are sets of regulations and um, conditions that you need to 
meet before you are given an import permit and even when you're exporting you if it's cities you need to have a scientific um permit from the country of origin uh, vet checks and everything you it's a series of documentation that you need to provide also so that you can be able to get an import permit for said animal um and let me see what else i'm missing um those are the permits that we issue um the wildlife program itself um also helps people when it comes to conflict um job or conflict um if you if you have jaguars coming into your farm and eating your cattle or they're coming very close to your community then you can give us a call and we will um respond to it um we can help um set up camera traps we can see what measures you can we can help you take so that we we avoid any conflict within the area um so that is one of the things that we also assist on if you want to relinquish a animal that you've had for as a pet let's say you had a kawati for for argument's sake you had a kawati and you don't really want the kawati anymore please do not release it in the wild you can call us you won't be penalized for it call us we will go and pick it up and we will assess the the animal before we even release it to the wild or before anything we do we need to assess these animals um so that is another thing that we do also um if you know of someone that is keeping animals and you know that these animals are in dire help need of help please give us a call too so that we can help these animals because um these animals sometimes we may see them as cute when they're small but when they get older they become aggressive and one of the things that i must highlight that most of these animals carry diseases and if these animals bite our kids or or us as adults we can catch diseases and it is detrimental to us and to our kids so it's advisable not to have these animals um and if you do have them at least be cautious and take all the necessary precautions in having these animals um so these are things that um i would advise the public to to, to bear in mind also um like i mentioned we have offices throughout the country you want to ask a question you want to know something about the the wildlife wildlife protection act please feel free to contact us you want a presentation you want to know more we are welcome to give those presentations we are more than willing to help you um our office number is 822-1524 and you just call and state what it is that you have what issue you have and we will um you, you can state your name or you can be com remain anonymous it doesn't really matter to us once you provide us good information and a contact number we are more than glad to help and reach out to you and see how best we can address the issues that we have um my message to you is please help help us we need your help um because a lot of times we have some animals that really need intervention and the only way they will get the intervention is if you help um help them because they cannot speak out for themselves um we've had many cases where people have animals that are in really dire conditions and they need help and sometimes we do help them and sometimes we're too late and the animals are are way past um anything and we there's no way we can possible way we can help them so in, to avoid those cases please help us please call the forest department if you have um anything any queries any issues please call, feel free to call the forest department like i mentioned you can provide remain anonymous we won't interfere with it you will stay strictly anonymous um and so like i mentioned feel free to call the forest department we're here to help you and we will accept all the help we we can get because we do need the public to come um on board and help us um we need to stop keeping our wild animals captive um it's like i mentioned they carry a lot of diseases that is my selling point they carry a lot of diseases they they are cute but they can become aggressive and they can um they can they can 
um, bring problems to, to to our homes and so it's best not to have them it's best to to give them up um and we're here we're here to help you and so again my plea is you help us and we will help you as much as possible thank you very much all right all right thank you very much miss victoria from the fires department um and again you can find all this information by either contacting them or if you go on the website, BWRC website, you will find these um, information. For example, the, the, the pictures we were showing is a part of uh, wildlife on the lab, right? the bucket guides that we have, which are part of the toolkit um, that you get being an ambassador, right? So <clears throat> I think it's time for a quiz, Calvin. Uh, what will we get if you win the quiz? Um. So we have these wristbands from the clinic that has the um, website URL and the phone number that you can call at any time for assistance with any wildlife species. And also we have some stickers that you will also, well, that you also have the chance to win if you answer our questions correctly. So attentive, everybody, as uh, we have the yeah, first okay. quiz coming right up. And thank you for everyone for viewing. I see um, many different people here viewing. Um, shout out to my students from Natural Science. Bribe them with a point, but that's okay. They will get their <laughs> point. Um, and we see some friends. We see our partners at Be Free. Um, thank you to, to Miss Heather for joining. And they say they're excited for this program just as how we are um, for it to begin in 2022. Wow. All right, so thank you everybody for watching. And I'm, I'm very sure uh, this is very good information for you all. And wow. we're here to, 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 to give out that information and help you out in that way, All right? Um, <clears throat> so not to forget, um, Calvin, would you tell us a bit about of our 2021 gala? Yeah, so uh, the BWRC gala for this year is again a virtual gala and even though we cannot, um, we will not be able to meet together in person, we still have some uh, action items for you that, well, that you can bid on, right? Uh. So the gist is you go to our uh, Facebook page yes. and under events, you will find the 2021 gala as an event, right? It will be virtual again. Uh, this is our fundraiser that we do every year. Um, uh, and we usually do it at the San Ignacio Hotel. However, since COVID is still around, uh, Mr. COVID has us doing everything virtual. Um, so you go to our page and we have very, very wonderful prizes, for example, uh, Blanc Canoe, Turtle Inn. Uh, we have different uh, food and juice items that you can go ahead and bid. The bid uh, instructions is to go to um, go to the page, find the the item that you are interested in. You can you can take a screenshot and then email that to us along with your bid, so that we take you as the bidder for that item. Obviously, the highest bid will win there um so you can call this some some type of a seal bid or a silent auction bid right so um we're excited because we have some really good um action items this year and thanks to our sponsors who um, are able to assist us in this way um to be able to um raise funds for right. the yeah. clinic right that's right all right, so, so first question. Let's do that first question. All right, so um, how it works is we put the question up on the screen. Mm -hmm. You get to read it, answer it. And the first one to get all the answer correct, the team here will be helping us with the answers. Um, and the first one who gets will get a small little uh, sticker and wristband package from the ambassador, the clinic, and the, the hotline. Mm -hmm. um, wristband All right so are you guys ready i think we're ready All right so question number one and calvin will be reading it to you there 
um, as we go along. So here we go. One, <laughs> I can't see. Question, this first question is a true and false question. True and false question. And we have six sentences there for which you will have to put either true or false for each uh, sentence. And this question is in regards to the Wildlife Protection Act of Belize, um, which Victoria just went over, right? So the first uh, sentence, sentence is in a way it is always illegal to hunt in a national park is that true or false a green iguana or a picari a female with offspring a gibnat white-tailed deer or a goatee a tapir or a toucan or um any hunting species during its close season so remember this is a true and false question and each um, each sentence has to be answered with either true or false for you to be able to win uh, the prize package that we have here for you all right so send in your answers as of now um to see which of these items you will win um so the question number one is gonna be up there for um a minute so you can continue reading analyzing and sending the correct answer so uh, send your answers on the comments yes so we're gonna see the comments right here as we go and we'll let you know if you have it um correct or not obviously we'll we will be giving the answers and discussing it briefly uh but which of these is true where can where is it illegal to hunt deer? Where and what? All right, and again, thank you everyone for watching. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you here online virtually. And as we see the little names popping up, you know, it's, it gets exciting to see you all, uh, you know, helping us with viewing. Interacting. interacting and of course it's it's really good when you guys um have an interaction with us and answering questions and if you have any questions anytime along the presentation please do so um of asking asking us uh what all questions you may have right so again you will answer a b c d e f right and for each you will put other uh, t or f Right, which is true on false, right? right? So, um, <clears throat> so we will. All right, so we have two answers, but you have to, Answer however, all. put from A to F so that you get uh, a chance to win the prize. <clears throat> all right, so if you want to take a screenshot quickly of the question so that you continue analyzing it, we're just going to move on. Uh, uh, real step. quickly to our second topic for today, uh, Andrea Castaneda has <clears throat> sent five answers there, and we'll have the team review it. But for now, let's get back to um, My the presentation. second presentation for the day, right? So we will have af right after and goes hand in hand with the Wildlife Protection Act and Wildlife Relation. Calvin will be talking about CITES and the IUCN and the Red Lakes, right? So I'll leave the time to Calvin. All right. So CITES is the abbreviation for <laughs> the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Right, and this um, international treaty is there in order to prevent wildlife from becoming endangered or extinct because of trade, right? And this site is more specifically for international trade and the Wildlife Protection Act is for the uh, local laws and regulations um, dealing with wildlife. 
So Belize has been a signatory of this convention since 1973. And basically what this convention is for is, well, again, to uh, prevent the impacts of trade on wildlife, right? So in order to import or export any wildlife or the list of wildlife species that are listed in the convention, you must have a permit, right? And this again also talks about the wildlife being, it does not, it can be either dead or alive and it could be a whole uh, specimen or individual or parts of, of that individual or specimen, right? So if you, anyway, and under this, convention there are three appendices that um, that indicate to indicate to us what the level of protection there is for each species listed under these appendices right and this is to control the trade of the um, different species in, in, in international trade. So in Appendix 1, these species listed under this appendix are species that are threatened with extinction. They have the greatest threat with the, with, of extinction, right? And these species have the greatest level of protection on them. And some species are even uh, restricted from being traded between countries. And another thing to mention is that every species, every individual species that is to be traded must, must have been gotten legally, right? So um, stealing an orphan from its mother is not legal, so that would uh, disqualify you in getting a permit to import or export uh, whatever species that is. So examples of these species that are under Appendix 1 are the manatees, the, our national animal, the tapir, howler monkeys, uh, yellow-headed parrots, and harpy eagles, um, American crocodiles, some neotropical river otters, the jabiru stork, scarlet macaws, and four of the five cats that we have here in Belize, which are the jaguarundi, the margi, the ocelot, and the jaguar, right? Then we have appendix two, and these are for species that are endangered, and also for similar species that look like the those endangered species or are in the same um, family. And trade with these species are controlled but still need to be um, obtained legally, right? So in this section, there's more than what, more than the uh, species here um, on the screen, but just to name a few, we have the Amazon, Amazon, Amazon parrots and mele para parakeets and the olive throated parakeet. And we also have the marlette crocodile. And yes, that is Buddha's from the zoo. And we have um, the puma, the boa, uh, boa constrictor, and the um, iguana. And also the hickety as part of this um, appendix. Then we move on to Appendix 3 of this um, CITES Convention. And these are species that are protected in at least one country that has asked other signatories of the convention to help in controlling the trade. And this appendix includes 
species such as the coatis, oscillated turkeys, porcupines, gibnuts, uh, both the parka and the aguti parka, um, the curacao, and also the great guan, and the, and the tamandua, and the red bracket deer, and the colored pikiri, right? And these are animals that are <laughs> protected by this convention, right? The trade is controlled for these animals between borders. Then we have the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And this has become the largest environmental network that aids in establishing frameworks for conservation actions across the globe, around the globe, <laughs> and to ensure that human progress continues, economic development um, also continues, and the conservation of our natural habitats, right? And as we've mentioned that we will be talking about the IUCN Red List, they have been well they have developed this list uh, to tell us more about the natural um how how the natural um, environment stands the natural yeah <laughs> and they have also um been important in starting the other conventions such as the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, the World Heritage Convention and CITES that we just spoke about, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. And in partner partnership with the United Nations Environmental Program and World Wildlife Fund, they created this the World Conservation Strategy for uh, for signatory countries and members of this union include states which are the countries that have signed as which are, are part of the union uh, governmental agencies ngos and also indigenous uh, people's organizations all right so the iucn red list is a database that serves as a guide to how to the status of our, status of our biodiversity right and this database uses a uh, quantitative data to evaluate their uh, level of extinction or the uh, risk of the extinction of each species and they have categories to this, right? And starting with extinct, which is EX, that there is no, no, there are no individuals living again in the natural world or in captivity. Then we have the extinct in the wild, which are species that only have individuals in captivity are no longer seen in the wild. Then critically endangered are species that are facing extremely high risk of extinction in the wild and endangered species that are, very, are facing only, a, well, not only, but a very high risk of extinction in the wild and vulnerable species also are facing high risk of extinction and near threatened that have not yet qualified for being vulnerable but are likely to qualify for that for the uh, threatened category uh, pretty soon and then we have least concern categories that are for populations of species that are stable for the time being and data deficient category that there is not enough data for subspecies to be categorized as yet and to give some examples of species that we find here in Belize, we have critical category, which uh, include 
the hickety, the Central American River turtle, and the yellow-headed parrot. And endangered species include howler monkey, our national animal, the tapir, and spider monkey. <coughs> Sorry. Vulnerable species in this list in, are uh, white-lipped pikiri, and near threatened are the jaguars. Uh, least concern would be brown-hooded parrots, right? And there is also uh, another category uh, specifying that species need to be that species are conservation dependent. And in this category, we have here as the marlet crocodile here in the knees. And all right, so those are the very important animals. I mean, uh, not only do they fall under these categories, but some of them have. Um, so much values to us Belizeans and as a whole that we should protect our wildlife no matter what. All right, so moving on to, um, oh, well, going back to the quiz questions, thank you very much for submitting your uh, response. Um, I see my sister-in-law, Ingris, dear, um, answering as well as Alex, Reina. I think they're both students. Um, thank you all for um, participating and you did get it super close. We will be uh, showing the answers now on the screen. Uh, there's a small little correction um, on what's on this screen right now. Um, but the winner, uh, and we thought it was Esther, but we reviewed that Andrea Castaneda uh, answered all of them correctly first. So Andrea, congratulations. You will get your um, little merch, of course, if you can pick it up here at the clinic in my 60 George Price Highway, or you can just let us know, inbox us how we can um, get that to you, right? So it, it would be preferred pickup only um, so that you can pass for your little uh, prizes here at the clinic. So um, you want to review it, Calvin, real quick? All right, so the question was, under the Wildlife Protection Act of Belize, it is always illegal to hunt in a national park. That is true. It is always illegal to hunt a green iguana or a piquiri. That is false. Uh, they both have an open Close season, open. right? And it is always illegal to hunt a female with offspring. Offspring, that is true. It That's is right. illegal to hunt uh, any female with an offspring. Right. And it is always illegal to hunt a gibnat white tailed deer or a goatee. That is also false because they and also they have their have seasons. Their season. And it is always illegal to hunt a tapir or a toucan. This is the uh, little mistake. correction. Yes. yes, the correction. This is true. It is illegal to hunt a tapir or a toucan. Right. And it is Ill always illegal to hunt species. any hunting species during their closed season. That is true. Once it is the closed season for any of the game species, it is illegal to hunt such species. All right. So this goes hand in hand with what Miss Victoria has shared. Right? And these are the uh, different little facts that you can uh, take a look at when it comes to hunting um, in specific places like a national park it's always illegal to hunt there right and please don't be hunting tapirs and toucans because it's always illegal to hunt toads right so thank you very much for um participating in the quiz we have two more questions um so please stay tuned to find out what those questions will be so that you are able to answer those right so pay attention to the um presentation we will give right now and remember the prizes will be uh, these cute little bands that we have here from the clinic we have stickers and we have larger stickers uh, from the ambassador program and the clinic so um, we see we see uh, sometimes random people having these little stickers in the car and we're excited to see that around here's this guy from San Ignacio he has one at the front back side um, and, and it's really cool to see um, you know our logo out there so that people can um, you know, ask themselves, you know, what is this clinic? They go Google it or, or find them on, on Facebook, and then you can find out more of 
uh, what we do and how we do to protect um, wildlife animals in need. All right. So moving on, I think it's me up next. Um, so also reiterating to what Miss Victoria said, it's always important to work in collaboration not only with us but with the wild uh, with the forest department so that um, we are able to um, help control these wildlife animals and, and reduce that risk. And why? And one of the main problems she mentioned is that these wildlife animals can give you diseases. So for that fact, we here at the clinic took it upon ourselves to do one of these animal, uh, sorry, zoonotic diseases a month, uh, per month so that we can just raise a bit of awareness and inform you, the public, about these diseases that you can catch um, when it comes to this interaction with okay. animals. So <clears throat> for today, we chose rabies, right? And I will be doing uh, the presentation on rabies and I'll be going over slightly what to do when it comes to um, if you get a wound or if a wound is infected, right? So this is our important analysis for the month. Well, rabies, um, the whole idea about zoonosis falls under the One Health concept, which connects the health of us humans, animals, as well as the environment together, right? So if we safeguard all these three parts, then you get one synchronous and peaceful um, environment that is healthy and safeguarded, right? So if we protect one, we protect all. And what we tend to forget here is the animals. If we don't protect their health, then it affects us and then eventually it affects the environment as a whole. Zoonotic diseases, what are zoonotic diseases? And again, remember, if you have any questions, please do share them on the comment and we'll be uh, more than delighted to uh, assist you with those answers, right? So what are zoonotic diseases? Zoonotic diseases are diseases that can spread between animals to humans, but guess what? They can also, you can also spread uh, those diseases from you know, humans to animals as well. So it's very important to, to mention these things because if we would have some type of uh, delicate population out there and we go and we spread one of these diseases, then um, you know that could cause trouble in our natural populations here in Belize. And uh, just a quick little fact there, and all these slides are straight off of the CDC website, which you can visit yourself and um, inform and know more about these diseases. Um, <clears throat> More than half of all the infections that we get are zoonotic. So half of all those diseases that we get in, um, infected by, they can spread between animal and, and people, right? These are what zoonotic diseases are. So that's 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 really alarming, right? So if we don't take care and we don't, and if we ignore this aspect, then you know we are putting our health at risk. A uh, couple interesting facts about what is rabies. Well, rabies occurs in more than 150 countries, and yes, our country is included there in those in that list. Um, dogs are the main source of human rabies death. 99% uh, of all uh, rabies transmission to humans are due to dogs. Asia and Africa and more of the poorer regions of the world are hot spots for rabies. And due to the fact that they have low income and the poverty level is so high, uh, not much can be done in terms of control um, unless you know we have external um, assistance and those type of things. Globally, rabies can cause uh, an estimated cost of $5.6 billion a year uh, due to you know, damage and destruction all over the world. 40% uh, of people that are bitten by suspect rabid animals are children under the age of 15. So, it's really scary to imagine that our children goes with not knowing, uh, touching dogs or cats or animals and not being careful, they get bitten and they capture rabies. That, that's super scary. That is why we uh, need to be able to share this with our children and educate them as well. So what is rabies? Rabies is a vaccine preventable zoonotic viral disease. So it's a virus that lives in the salivary glands of uh, mammals mostly, and we're going to see that in just a bit. Uh, but it says once these clinical sy symptoms appear, they're virtually 100% fatal, and that's unfortunate. 
right? So there's not necessarily we, we have uh, prevention, but when it comes to cure, there's no cure. Um, most persons, um, if you don't act quickly enough, you will die. Rabies come from animal bites, like I said, when animal go ahead and bite you, they create an open wound and that saliva goes through that wound into your system. And then once it reaches the, the central nervous system, it will uh, affect you with those symptoms, right? Important here and why we talk about this is because not only does it affect domestic animals, but it also affects wild animals as well. So if you are out there and you see any wildlife, you know, be careful you know you never suspect one of those mammals out there having rabies so like i said who can get them mammals all warm-blooded animals that um that have fur here and produce live young right that's the definition of mammals and all these mammals um, can acquire rabies belize has about 145 mammal species living in belize uh, so out of those, we have some that can transmit it with a higher rate than others. However, just be precautious and avoid avoid uh, being in close contact with these critters as much as possible. Uh, red flag when it comes to these mammals, we have the um, <clears throat> foxes, we have raccoons, which are super uh, problematic when it comes to rabies. We have other things like... Um, skunks and those type of animals and most importantly here in belize as i will be mentioning are the bats right? the bats are the number one uh source of transmission here in belize uh, so it's super important not to pick up bats like i will share in just a bit so how do we get it the virus like i said lives in the salivary glands of animals and it goes through bites right it does not transmit through any blood feces or urine um, and you cannot get rabies by just touching and rabid animals. Of course, take precaution, never go ahead and go that close to a rabid animal. So if the virus is not taken care of, it attacks the central nervous system, which is consisted of your brain and your, and your spinal cord, um, which is the command center of your body. And eventually it will attack those neurons, those nerve cells and they will die and the virus will spread all over your brain and it will uh, eventually um, your brain will get swollen and you will uh, catch a coma and eventually yeah you won't make it so like i mentioned it's a uh, hundred percent fatal unfortunately however it is a hundred percent preventable if we do uh, know about these things and know what to do f about it then we can prevent this in the first place. Uh, the number one thing to do is vaccinate your pets. If you have dogs or cats at home, these can acquire rabies, and you never know when a bite can, uh, when a bat can come around bite these dogs, and they can acquire rabies. And before we know it, they will be showing symptoms, and it will be a super danger to us. So vaccinate your pets. Have those rabies vaccine up to date um, when it comes to that prevention method awareness and education and uh, i reiterate this a lot due to the fact that children are the ones that are uh, affected a lot so if you teach your children hey be careful not to touch a dog when it's feeding when it's um, with young when you do not mash its tail and things like that will allow you to avoid bites in the first place right stay away from wildlife as much as possible yes nature is amazing However, let's observe from far, keep our distance, and don't let wildlife come close to us. Uh, if you are someone who works with wildlife, like ourselves here in the clinic, uh, we handle animals when it comes to their care and what's not. So we would be considered as high risk, as well as the forestry department officers, uh, zookeepers, veteran, veterinary technicians. It's important to get your pre-exposure shots, which are the vaccines, uh, in order to prevent rabies as well. How does rabies look like? Well, it all depends and it's kind of hard to tell since the virus, like our viruses, will have its incubation period. In terms of the incubation period for rabies, again, it can depend. It can be any way as short um, as one week to an entire year. Um, the average is around three to four months. However, like I said, and I repeat, once symptoms show up, you're a goner, right? 
Um, so initial signs of rabies may include fever, pain, an unusual tingling sensation in that bite wound. If that happens, you know, you know, do take precaution and get some medical help. Animals or humans, for that matter, will show abnormal behavior when they are infected. Remember, this affects your brain and your central nervous system. So you would have some involuntary nerve actions that uh, would be telltale signs of um, rabies, right? Obvious signs when you see this on an animal, if it's seizure foaming from the mouth, paralysis means, you know, they're completely frozen or if they're falling over, they can't stand up. Uh, an aggressiveness to inanimate objects, this will be um, telltale signs that hey, it's rabies, right? Uh, when it comes to inanimate objects, and I do believe we have a video in just a bit. However, these animals, for example, in that video, I will ask you to observe it when I do play. But, <clears throat> okay, that won't come out. You can quickly grab that. Yes, so um, <clears throat> when it comes to these animals, they have they can face hydrophobia or areophobia. Hydrophobia would mean, um, you know, the fear of water. And eventually this would reach to them and they would get all aggressive when it comes to water, or even, you know, just the air, they would see uh, sort of um, illusions and they would be aggressive against that. All right. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to treatment, the number one thing you can do is not ignore any bites or scratches. You may say, oh, that was a small scratch. However, if you're playing with your dog, he scratches you um, and that occurs, you can never know when your dog can drool on you and that, that rabies virus can transmit through that saliva. So whenever you get any bite scratches or even a, a tiny little nip from you know, the nail or the claw or something, do wash that wound, right? Um, so the best thing to do is wash that wound continuously with soap and water for from anywhere from five to 15 minutes. Um, the CDC recommends 15 minutes. So wash, wash wounds as much as possible, right? Like I said before, it takes a good while to reach the central nervous system. Uh, but if <clears throat> it reaches the central nervous system, it might be way too late. So rabies in Belize, um, fortunately speaking, um, the last human case here in Belize is 1989. So we hadn't had a human case uh, for the very longest, a couple of years. So that's good. However, there is a current outbreak in the livestock that we need to pay attention to. And, and the thing is with these outbreaks is that if one person slips or we, we allow this to spread you know, from one person, then it will spread farther and uncontrollably, right? So cattle and some sheep have been um, known to get them recently, right? The, the, the main problem that Baha has right now is with the cattle, right? So for any, um, if for any, any given reason you want to stick your hand down a, a, a cattle, so do not do it because, well, they have teeth, they can scratch you, and then they can drool all up on you, right? <clears throat> but like I said before, the rabies virus is transmitted uh, mainly through bats. And in Belize, we have 81 bat species. Specifically, the one that um, gives the rabies virus is the vampire bats. However, I myself, I'm not a no uh, bat expert. Right, so it's hard to tell them apart. So the, the the thing that we recommend is never touch a bat in the first place, right? Bats can have rabies. Sometimes you will see them laying down in the ground, just leave them there. Um, fortunately, you know, you can't do much about it um, and just let them be, right? It's super important to not have these animals you know, being a risk to us, right? So that is the video that I am talking about here. Um, I will just show it here on the screen. Um, and let's see if you guys can see it.
All right, so it's small there. Let me just quickly fix that for you um, so that you can observe closer. And tell me what you observe here on the um, comments section. So we have the little fox right there. What do you see? And I, I think we did this for a quiz, um, but now we're just putting it in the context. Uh, but we see a little fox there that's specifically a gray fox. Um, and we observe various little things there. And I think we'll get back to it. <clears throat> All right. So just to finish things off uh, with wound care, how to take care of your wounds, um, <clears throat> right? Or what we call emergency wound care. We'll get back to that video in just a bit. Um, <clears throat> what is an open wound? Well, the, an open wound is any injury involving an external or internal breakage of the of anybody tissue. Usually, it's the skin. Right, an infection. How to tell what an uh, what is infected? It's gonna be red. It's gonna be swollen. It's gonna be you know a bit warm and painful to the touch. And obviously, if it's oozing any bodily fluids, um, that is definitely infected. We have some little gory pictures, but from left to right, um, you would see that the first one and A, it's it's super. Um, in flame, it's it's swollen. Um, it has some fluids there, uh, and then at B, it's still not a hundred percent clean. It still has some body fluids that you might be able to clean. And then C then tells you how an open wound would look like. We have these infographics from the CDC website, and which we would love to share. If you are interested, we can send you them personally. Um, it's a good little guide to have around you whenever any injuries or um, these type of things happen. But to just summarize, right? Whenever you have a wound, well, I, the, the number one thing you can do is never ignore it. Always wash it. Avoid any contact with any dirty materials, be it dirt, uh, dust, anything that is not disinfected. Do not go there and do not touch it. You know, wash, wash, wash it as much as possible with soap and water. Um, and when you have it clean, you want to go ahead and cover it uh, with some type of bandage that uh, it allows that barrier to the outside environment. Seek immediate help, right? And that is medical help if it is due to a, uh, a bite or some sort um, and anything that puts you at risk, right? If, it, if it's an open puncture wound, do get medical attention right um one last little fact there it's hard to um clean a wound as effective as possible but you always try your best to get it as clean um so that you don't run any risk of infection um a thing that i want to share there is that sometimes if we do not go ahead and clean it properly and we cover it before it being clean, we can trap some bacteria and other infectious uh, materials in there, and then eventually, you know, it would get infected way fast, faster, and then it will cause more trouble to you, right? Um, and lastly, when it comes to wounds that are due to to anything that is rusty, unclean, um, and Anything that has feces, soil, or saliva, ensure you get medical help or attention um, due to the fact that you can't get many things uh, due to this, right? We already share if it's a bite, uh, ensure that you get attention for rabies if it's um, something rusty or something contaminated with soil. Uh, pay attention to it because there is a bacteria which is tetanus, and if you don't have a vaccine for it, then it will get you infected, all right? So that is what I have for rabies and wound infection. Uh, but if you remember the video, we have the video showing the rabid fox. And first of all, he's not on his four. He is laying down uh, 
there and he can't necessarily move. He's, he's, he's in a state of paralysis. Um, and... God. I could just preach right over that. He's in a state of paralysis. And if you notice closely, he's actually biting the cage door. And it's, it's an inanimate object, but he is biting it and being super aggressive against it. Right, he has that involuntary twitches, which is due to that nerve damage due to the rebase value. Alright, so going back, that is rabies and uh, wound infection. And again, if you have any questions regarding this, please contact us 615 51 59. We are here to help, we're here to um, educate you all when it comes to these things because. Um, Putting our health is important. Putting our health first is what we should do always. All right. What's next, Calvin? So now we will be moving on to our third and last quiz question for this That's slide. Second, and remember, for these questions, you can win the wristband with the um, hotline number on it. And these stickers from the clinic and from the wildlife program. protection uh, wildlife ambassador program sorry <laughs> all right so we have the second question on screen well this one specifically is a multiple uh choice so you can choose based on the small presentation that i just gave on rabies yes um uh, this question is a short one um, here in Belize, our main vectors of rabies are options A, raccoons, B, foxes, C, crocodiles, or D, bats. Um, remember to just type your answer in the comments and we will see who answers the question first. All right, so that's question two. And while we have some time, we would, well, remind you again of the gala fundraiser that we will be having again on the 5th of December and of the action items that are posted on the, our Facebook page, the event, under the gala event and also on our Instagram page in the highlights of our stories and on the wall of the Instagram profile. That's right. So go window shopping on our page. You can go to the event and we also have it up on uh, our Instagram page where you can see it and go under highlights. We have a, a highlights for Gala and you can see all the wonderful uh, action items that we have there. Right. So our quiz question has been answered and this one was a super easy one. So thank you very much for answering. I think the first one was uh, Hannah and Mark Puff, right? So bats, like I mentioned, is the number one vector of rabies here in mm -hmm. our country. Not to be confused with the number one animal or, or the, the, the species that are getting it, right? So will we do a third question? I think we'll save it okay. up for later. We have one small little um, presentation left, and that is the complex species of the month. Right, so I'm gonna go real quick with the species for this month. Right, um, and the one we chose is raccoon. <laughs> right, so raccoons, like I said in the rabies videos, is one of the um, animals that can also spread rabies to you. And well, um, to be honest, they're they're much problematic when it comes to uh, conflict and these type of things. So it's important, and even though we're presenting on uh, raccoons, it's important to, to get these guidelines and these tips and things that can help you in general for other animal, animals as well. For example, much more common than a raccoon here in Belize, we have coatis, right? These coatis are, well, they're similar to raccoon in almost every sense, and while well, they're actually uh, closely related um taxonomically right i think they're from the same family uh right they are 
closely related there. So raccoons are what we call the New World primates. Um, it's one of the first primates here in the Americas that, well, yeah. Um, by the New World, we mean the Americas, right? So they are primates, they are arboreal, they live in the trees. Um, and a, a wonderful fact is that they um, can adapt easily to new environments. And especially when it comes to urbanization, if you have uh, different layouts in terms of cities and things, they will adapt easily and they will live almost ritually anywhere. Right? They are social species, even though sometimes you see them to, uh, alone. Um, they are very social and they cannot necessarily survive um, solitary. Right? They need that social interactions um, there. Right? So a lot of people think that you know they, they, they are solos, but um, they are actually social species. Breeding occurs yearly from February to June, uh, and they usually have around a litter of four offspring, right, that they usually do when they, do when they mate. Sexual immaturity would be around eight to 12 months uh, for female and for the male would be one year, right, 12 months. When it comes to the lifespan, these raccoons can live up to 16 years, but the average would be around five. Um, when it comes to their feeding mode, they are what we call opportunistic omnivores. They eat fruits, veggies, uh, veggies um, any amphibians, lizards, small mammals, even birds, insects, roots, bugs. Right, so they can virtually eat anything. You plant out there, they can go out there and eat your little veggies that you are you have in your backyard garden. Um, the ecological role would be as population control for uh, small rodents and those type of other pests, um, as well as seed dispersal when they eat fruits, right? They're, they're able to spread those seeds out, right? However, the whole reason of why we do these conflict species is that they pose public health concerns or issues to us and they can give us diseases. Some of those diseases, like I mentioned, is already rabies and you know the fatality of rabies and what why it is important to know about. However, they have other things like roundworm, uh, mange, and leptospirosis, which are all zoonotic diseases that can affect us as humans. So again, when we see a raccoon, do all the best to stay away from them and avoid physical contact. However, um, you may see, well, I, I don't want to come close to them, but they come close to me. And well, and indirectly, we're kind of giving them an invite into our house when we um, have available space through them. Um, and a couple of solutions when it comes to these interaction, this human raccoon interaction that we call it, um, in general, is to calmly and deliberately encourage these raccoon to move out of your um space or your house, right? They usually can live in attics, they can live in in, in crevices right. inside of walls. So if you shine a light there or you play a, a, a little radio there that can uh, make some noise, that would scare them off and have them not come there, right? If you already have them in your wall or your roof, what you can do is kind of enclose everything and let one little, uh, it can be homemade or I, I, I do guess the, the have these things on sale, the uh, one-way doors, so that these animals can go out and they cannot come in back. Just make sure that the, um, the, the litter or the bunch of raccoons that are there are at least old enough to walk out by themselves because if they're not, then you're gonna make the mom walk out and then you will leave a bunch of orphan raccoons there on your uh, roof or attic. Secure your trash cans, right? If we left scraps of food, you know, that is a, a very opportunistic meal for them. So they will go there and they will eat. So ensure that if you have like jumps or, or different things, bins outside your yard, secure it. Put something on top or cover it very tightly so that these raccoons do not enter. A clean yard would also help, you know, not having rubbish all over the place so that they can hide 
you know, a clean mode lawn would um, encourage, you know, these guys to just stay away. Um, dog food, sometimes we just leave, leave our dog food, suck all of, you know, in the, in the yard. They can eat dog food. This is perfect food for them. So they will go and forage for your dog food. So secure it um, tightly somewhere where they cannot reach. Exclusion. Um, you know, that, that would be the best thing in the first place. Seal whatever little holes you have in your walls, attics, roofs, so that they cannot um, uh, enter, right? It's it's um, encouraged to use some type of wire gauge all around your ceilings so that you have that barrier and they cannot come in. But don't use flimsy wire, at least a 16 gauge wire mesh in order for them not to bite it and, and still enter. So at the end of the day, raccoons, quarries, do we make good pets? Well, no. First and foremost, because they can give you so many diseases that we, we cannot even mention everything here. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of diseases that they can pass to you. Um, and while it's it's illegal to, to, to keep them as pets just like that. And three, they're made to live, to, to live peacefully in the wild and uh, they are able to find their um, perfect living spaces they're able to find food out there in the wild and they don't need us um, to take care of them they will take care of themselves right so generally speaking wildlife do not make good pets um, so it's not encouraged to keep these guys we see um, koaris are kind of um, usual to have right we call them squash here quash here in belize uh, however, they are super similar to raccoons and they can pass rabies, they can pass all these other things to us, to our children, to our pets. So it's best to not keep them as pets. Okay. Alright, so that is our conflict species of the month. We have suggestions for another one. Um, when we have a little poll there, what is the biggest attraction to raccoons to your yard, um, right? And you can also participate that way there, right? So <clears throat> let us go back to our last quiz question for the day and we will uh, probably say goodbye with that. Um, and thank you for joining us um, and being here with us today for this live. So question number three, Calvin. All right, so this is another um, multiple choice question. And the question says, how can humans get infected with rabies? The options are A, if an animal licks a surface and we touch it, we can become infected. B, contact with animal feces or urine transmits the rabies virus. C, an infected animal. Animal bite that breaks the surface of the skin will infect the victim or D, all of the above. Now remember only the first part, well, we noticed here on the chat that, uh, on the chat, sorry, on the comment section that uh, one person said that they answered first, but we are going in accordance to how the comments come out on the comment section, right? So. So sorry about that, but you know. I think it was faster. very close. It was <laughs> super close, and, and um, I guess Facebook shoots us the first one there, and probably it was just split seconds. But um, Hannah was the first one to get that answer there correct, mm -hmm. and uh, we have Hannah <laughs> answering once more. Um, no, it's correct. <laughs> yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is correct. All right. So the correct answer there is actually that one that um, Anna posted, which is C, an infected animal bite that breaks the surface of the skin and that will infect the victim through the saliva, right? Yeah. So that is our last question for the day. It's been a pleasure being with you all. Um, and... Uh, do keep in touch uh like us on facebook at uh bwrc we also have instagram up and going we're very active when it comes to different content we post at least three times a week um, educational stuff we have the gala up and running 
with different um, action items that are being posted as we speak. You know, different donations are coming in from uh, different sponsors, right? And thank you to uh, those donors that are able to help us with these items that we can action and in turn create, um, you know, fundraise for the clinic here. Yes, that's right. Any last thoughts, Calvin, before we sign out? You mentioned the gala right here. Yes. yes, so the gala is gonna be December the 5th, and I confused my stories with these events yesterday. But December the 5th is the annual gala, it's gonna be virtual. However, auctions are open. I mean, the bids you're, you, you are free to bid as of now. Um, you know, it's secure, whatever you want, whatever it seems nice to you, you want to go for it. Um, there's some Miss Debs $50 vouchers, there's um, I think it's hoodies. Fifty dollars, juices, massage, um, and then there's the, the the bigger items like hotel stays at luxury resorts like Blancano, uh, Turtle Inn, Mystic, Mystic River, River Parrot Nest. These are super places that you know we usually don't get to visit otherwise. So they <laughs> go for a very good price if you are able to bid early enough. Right, so make sure okay. you uh, keep in date, update with what the clinic is doing, and we'll be glad to welcome you always. All right, so for the winners, we will have your little prizes here at the clinic. Um, you can pick them up um, any anytime within working hours, Monday to Friday, eight to five, um, and we'll be here to welcome you and take a small little picture with your prize, um, so that we can, you know create that 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 excitement for others all <laughs> right so thank you once again um for joining us and our next live will be uh december 15th all right so the gala is the fifth december 15th is our other uh monthly live for the program right? and remember if you want to be a part of the um, wildlife ambassador program to so email us and we will also be getting in touch with past ambassadors from 2018 and other new ambassadors of partner organizations that is right represent the wildlife this is free um, thanks to the sponsorship of gf right and you get uh, free education free training free materials uh, and so that we can all join forces together and save the wildlife of the country with that we're gonna say Goodbye, and thank you everyone for watching today.